thank you so much. Um, thank you for the organizers to, to invite me to this, and thanks to all of you who came. Um, so my name is Knut Lundroth. I'm, I'm a professor of social medicine uh, at Karolinska at the Department of Public Health Sciences. And I'm also senior physician in social medicine uh, at the uh, Center for Epidemiology and Community Medicine, which belongs to the county council. Now, I, I believe my job today is to inspire you um, and about research in general, uh, but perhaps specifically to maybe inspire a few of you at least to become interested in my discipline of social medicine, which is very much linked to global health, which is something I will talk about uh, quite a lot uh, in, in, this, in this talk. So the title I put is How to Break the Poverty Disease Trap, the Case of Tuberculosis, or TB. Uh, so I will talk about poverty and disease, which is a very predominant theme in social medicine. Um, now, why TB? Well, it happens that I have been doing research on TB for more than 25 years. Uh, I spent also about 14 years in, in the World Health Organization, both doing research but also working on policy development on, on TB. And then I'm pursuing more research after I came back to Karolinska to, to take this chair as professor of social medicine. <coughs> now, um, I hope that all of you have by this time heard about the sustainable development goals. If not, learning about what they are, because you, you get, we're all going to live with them for at least the next 15 years. Um, within the, those, this is the UN goals uh, about development, and they're set for 2030, so people talk about Agenda 2030. Um, there is one health goal, number three. Actually, it's, it's many goals. It's many targets, considering uh, a lot of different health conditions. Tuberculosis, TB is one. But actually, there are health-related goals in all of the other goals. Things like malnutrition, things like uh, safe water, uh, clean energy and a good environment, um, decent living conditions, urban planning. So anyone who has done a little bit of public health studies or work knows that there are things that are very clearly related to health. Um, there is sort of a slogan in the, in the uh, SDGs, as they're called, the Sustainable Development Goals, that health is a contributor and a beneficiary of development. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that health is seen as a fundament for development. So if you invest in health, including investing in healthcare, you will help development. But it goes both ways. So health is also a beneficiary of development. If you invest in development, then you will also create a foundation for better health for individuals and for public health. Now, this talk about, and I'm going to illustrate, let's go back one, one slide. Um, you can have virtues or good uh, circles in between health and development. So if you have development, you create conditions for better health, you create better uh, conditions for health, you get better development, and so it can develop. But you can also have vicious or negative circles where poverty leads to disease, and disease aggravates poverty, and round it goes in a negative circle. And what I'll do in this talk is to illustrate this around the case of, of tuberculosis, of TB. So just a few words about TB. TB is a very small public health challenge in this country and in our neighbor countries, but it's a huge public health challenge globally. Just to give you some of the statistics, about 10 million people fall ill with this disease every year. So that's the equivalent of the Swedish population every year falling ill with this deadly disease. About 2 million people die every year. If you translate that into death per, per day, it's about 5,000. And to put it in perspective, that's half the deaths in the Ebola West Africa outbreak, if you remember that one. And it happens every day, and it's been doing that for decades, actually centuries in some places. So it's a huge burden uh, globally. Actually, it's one of the ten leading causes of death. And if you look at any single agent infection, dis infectious disease, it is the leading cause of death. It even surpassed HIV AIDS a couple of years back. Uh, and that is because HIV AIDS deaths have been dropping 
more rapidly than TB, and the main reason is the scale-up of antiretroviral treatments. Um, this graph is showing the trend of incidence, so the number of, of new TB cases globally. Uh, in green, it's the estimated number of cases. And the, the shaded area here is the confidence interval, because this is based on estimates, whereas this line here is showing the number of notified cases. So the best estimate tells us, first of all, that the incidence is going down, but very slowly. Um, disappointingly slowly, slowly actually. Um, it also tells us then that the number of people that get access to, let's call it quality assured treatment, compared to the estimate number, there's a big gap, an estimated to be about 4 million people every year who do not get access to good quality TB care. And that is a huge challenge, first of all, for those individuals' health, but also because this is a missed opportunity of stopping transmission by curing people from the disease. So this is one of many challenges that, are, that we face globally for this disease. This map is showing you the, the differences in TB incidence in different parts of the world. And the darker um, uh, shade of green means higher incidence. And you can see it's Africa, South of Sahara, and large part of Asia that have high incidence of TB. This is mainly correlated with uh, 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 national wealth. So poor countries have very high rates, and rich countries tend to have very low rates. There is one additional major driver in southern Africa, and that is the HIV epidemic. It breaks down your immune system, it makes you susceptible for uh, developing TB when, you, when you're infected. This is another way of showing the world map of TB, just to make that point about the link between TB and poverty, or TB and economic situation. So here, is, here are all the world's countries, uh, and plotted as a correlation between GDP per capita and TB incidence. So you see that the richer a country is, the lower the TB incidence is. It is not a straight line, but it's a pretty clear uh, association here. One thing that is clear here is that if you're a low income or a lower middle income country, it is very difficult to have low TB incidence. You can still be a pretty rich upper middle income country and mess up things and, and have high rates. But the important thing is that it seems to be difficult to take a shortcut and get to really low rates without doing something about the economic and social situation in the country. Um, this has been known for a long time. If we look at historical data on TB incidents in this part of the world, so including Stockholm, this is an example from uh, some cities in, in Europe, that, that, um, uh, and, and, and what we've seen from, from the uh, available historical data is that it seems to be first an increase in the rates. If we take Stockholm, for example, end of, of the 18th century, an increase related to industrialization, urbanization, people moving into cities, crowded living, a lot of urban poverty, poor living conditions, and also a lot of uh, undernutrition. All these factors contributed to make fertile ground for, for TB. And then the incidence declined dramatically. It took time, but it came down to very low levels so by mid-20th mid century, around 1950, rates were already really low. And what's important to know, and I'll come back to that, there was no cure for TB until then, 1950. So most of this development has been poverty reduction, better living conditions, less undernutrition, and so on. Now, if we continue into the... Uh, yeah, well, a little comment on the situation. Um, a guy who was operating in northern Germany at this time, uh, around 1850s, um, called Rudolf Fischer. I think you may know him as the pathologist. He has been doing a lot of important research in, in the pathology and generally in medicine. But he happens also to be the father of my discipline, of social medicine. And he observed that in Germany, at this time, about 20% of all deaths were due to TB. And it was mainly the poor who got sick and to, who died. If you have... Uh, um, read uh, a bit of history, you have probably come across quite a lot of historical persons who had TB and died from TB. Famous people, rich people. They have the Chopins and the Kafka. There have been books written about them and of these people. And these are the people who told the story, but there are no biographies of all the poor people who died from the disease. So you can easily get the misconception that it was equally distributed. It was not. It was mainly the poor who died. And Virchow, he said, observing this, that this situation, it shows that there are disturbances 
in the development of our populations, and those disturbances arise from political and social institutions and are therefore preventable. And what he meant by preventable, actually, between the lines, preventable through social and economic policy, not directly through medical interventions. I'll come back to that. So Fischau sort of stipulated this, this model, that poverty leads to TB. Uh, it can be mediated through undernutrition, poor housing conditions and crowding, generally poor health that breaks down your immune system, and poor healthcare access. Now, of course, TB is not caused by poverty. It's caused by a bacteria. And his contemporary and compatriot, um, uh, Robert Koch, uh, a few decades later, he discovered the bacteria. He proved the germ theory. He proved that this is a communicable disease. It's spread by coffee. Now, Koch was right, of course. But Fischer was no less right, because he was talking about causality in another way, the causes that create the fertile ground for the bacteria to take hold, to thrive, and cause disease. Um, after Cox, this is a little bit of a historical lesson, but it's important to drive home the message about the linkage of, of TB and poverty and what has been diminish, uh, helped diminishing the TB rates over time in, 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 uh, in rich countries today. It took 70 years from the discovery of the bacteria until there was a cure for the disease. And in the meantime, uh, there were some medical interventions, basically putting people in sanatoria. This is the sanatoria era. And the treatment was fresh air, sunlight, good food, and a little bit of surgical interventions, collapsing lungs and the like. That had a very marginal uh, efficacy. Um, but there was some important public health interventions to just to diagnose and register and isolate people helped to reduce the transmission to some extent. So that was also what the sanatoria did. It took people away from society, so there was no less of the spread of the disease in, in the society. So this contributed to further decline of, of the disease in the, in the 20th century. And this is data from England and Wales. It's very representative from, for all other countries, basically, in Europe uh, during the 20th century. There was a continued decline of, of, of TB, um, except for two pikes. These were what Fischer would have called disturbances in our populations, namely the First and the Second World War. So here's another social cause of, that is, is linked to, to TB uh, incidents. But there were these public health interventions as well, such as uh, pasteurizing milk to stop bovine TB, TB in cows, to spread to humans. Um, there was vaccination with BCG. It is still around, we still use it. Unfortunately, it's not very efficacious. It protects young children from severe forms of TB, but it doesn't give a lifetime protection that is good. It doesn't give you uh, a lot of herd immunity, if you like. Not enough to really contribute to the TB epidemiology. And then there was this constant um, attempt to find the cure for TB. And finally, in 1946, the first antibiotic that, uh, helped, that, that worked for TB was discovered. That was streptomycin. And then a number of other antibiotics uh, uh, came on the market as well. And that helped the sort of final push until very, very low rates of TB were, were reached in the rich countries, in the industrialized world. Um, I'll just add another case study, and that is for Sweden. Um, starting from 1940 to last year, there's been a dramatic reduction in TB incidence. Um, this is again when streptomycin came onto the market. Actually, it took it a couple of years before it was really used widely because it was uh, not much available and was really expensive. And I leave it to you to, to uh, judge how much this availability of the medical intervention helped to push down the incidence of TB. You will note that the decline was already very fast before that happened. So again, this and this was mainly driven by social economic development, less uh, malnutrition, better housing, and better health in general. Okay, nevertheless, when the antibiotics came in the end of the 1940s, it changed a little bit the paradigm of how to control TB globally or in a given country. And the sort of core element of, of global TB strategy over, over the coming decades, of, from the 1950s and, on, and onwards, have been, to put it very simple, you find the person who's sick, you kill the bug, and thereby you stop the transmission. And it makes a lot of sense, and it does work, but it doesn't work enough. So I'll take you back to this slide showing the very moderate dis decline in incidence. 
it has not enough uh, impact on the, on the transmission. It does, however, have a very immediate impact on death because what it does, it reduces the uh, case uh, fatality really dramatically. So that was the first thing that was seen. And we still see today that the TB death rates have been going down uh, uh, quite dramatically. Now, what is needed then? Why is there a limited impact uh, of the efforts that have been done up to date? Well, one thing is we still have those missing cases. So there's still a lot of things to do to reach those, and it's mainly poor people with poor access to health services that have problems getting into care. So you need to create equitable health access, you need better diagnostics, and you need to consider to do active case finding or screening in certain high-risk groups, again, tend to be the poor and the vulnerable. Now, another big challenge is that we estimate that about one-third of the world's population are already infected by the bacteria. And as it is with TB, if you're infected, you have a 10% lifetime risk, on average, to develop the disease. But 90% never develop the disease. Okay, so only 10%. But 10% out of 2 billion people, it is still a lot. So you need to do something about this pool of people who are affected. So even if you stop transmission today, you need to do something about that. Um, so what can you do? Well, you can treat uh, for latent infection. That's another topic. I do some research on that as well, but it will not be the, the, uh, the focus of the talk today. We are hoping for a better vaccine that could be used post-exposure for people with a latent form of the disease so that they do not develop the disease. That is a hope, but there, is, there are some in the pipeline, but there is no really good candidate that we think will be available in the next 10 years at least. And then, to bring you back now to the topic of TB and poverty, you can look at uh, a, a reducing prevalence of those factors that put people at risk of progressing from infection to active disease. Um, so I'm going to now look at this part of this framework that I already showed you, the um, aspect of generally poor health making you more susceptible to develop TB. What are those things that are direct risk factors for TB uh, and, and can increase your risk of, of developing the disease? So we have done um, quite a lot of work in this space, um, among other things, a couple of systematic reviews to look at certain specific risk factors. Uh, and they're listed here. It's not an exclusive list. It doesn't include everything. It includes risk factors that seem to be important on a global level. And it's the strength of, of, the, of the association, the relative risk that determines that, but also how common the risk factors are. If you put these two things together, which we have done, you can calculate something that is called the population attributable fraction. So anyone who's done a little bit of epidemiology will have learned that this is a measure of how large part of a disease burden can be attributed to a specific risk factor. Okay? So it means, for example, HIV, 15%. If you eradicate HIV, you will have a 15% reduction in TB incidence. If you eradicate hunger and undernutrition, you'll get 21%. If you eradicate diabetes, you will have 15% reduction. Good luck with that. It's going in the wrong direction. Uh, <coughs> alcohol use, same, same thinking, smoking 50%, and indoor air pollution, 17%. Now, what's the link with poverty here? Well, some of these risk factors are directly poverty-related. HIV, undernutrition, and indoor air pollution. We come from burning biofuel in really poor stoves in, in dwellings with really poor uh, uh, ventilation. The other factors, they are all socially determined. The poverty link is not as clear, but it's there. And we know for at least all high-income and middle-income countries, there is a very strong social gradient. So if the poorer you are, or the lower socioeconomic status you have, the more uh, risk of diabetes, the more alcohol misuse, and, and, the, and, the, and the more you are likely to smoke. So there is an indirect link with addressing the poverty issues. So now I'm going to expand on this framework a bit. So now I put in HIV, diabetes, smoking, alcohol, etc., etc., as those things that belong to the heading of poor health condition. And I also add another loop here. Now, I talked about the vicious circle. So poverty, uh, through a number of mechanisms, put you at risk of getting TB. Now, TB puts you at risk of getting more poor, uh, even poorer. Part of the reason is that if you don't have a good health system, a system where you have to pay out of pocket for health services, then you run the risk of becoming really poor just to access treatment, to pay for the consultations, for the tests, and for the drugs. On top of that, 
Often, if you have not decentralized your health services, you need to pay a lot for the transport to get there. You may be hospitalized for months sometimes. You have to pay for the food yourself. You have to bring your family members. There are a lot of costs involved. And finally, you, you risk, you have a big risk actually of losing, if not your entire income, a big part of it. Either because you're too sick to work, or because you have a dangerous infectious disease, so you're not allowed to work, or because um, undue stigma and discrimination. So you may be fired, you may be socially marginalized, you may be thrown out of school. So these kind of social consequences we see a lot. So this is how this vicious circle can be completed. Now, I'll use this framework to try to address the, the question I posed in, 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 my, in my heading, namely, how can you break this circle? Well, in principle, you can do it in many different places. So you can think of fighting poverty. That's the SDG agenda, or part of it. The big issue, political, not, not so much the health sector can do about it. Um, next, we can address the risk factors directly. We can you know, work on HIV, diabetes, smoking, alcohol. This is the classical public health agenda, if you like. Um, we can improve access to health services. This is health system strengthening, making health systems work for everyone and be accessible to everyone. We can do work on latent infection and finding better vaccines. This is medical prevention. And of course, we can work on getting better diagnostics and better, better antibiotics for better treatment and to gear the health staff and the health systems to deliver those things in a better way. So this is classical health care. It doesn't stop there. Then there are things, questions about how do you stop this part of the visual circle? Now, all of these things will actually help indirectly to stop this as well. But here we need something in addition, which is social support. So when people get sick, they may need to have financial support or support in kind to diminish and mitigate some of the socioeconomic consequences. And I'll come back to that. I circle it because the remainder part of my talk will focus on this. Not saying it's the most important thing, but this is a research area that we are doing quite a lot of work on in, in, at this point in time. Um, so I'll take you through the journey of work that we have done so far. We did a systematic review a couple of years back, and I've also done some of the original studies that are included here, looking at what type of costs do pe people with TB face in low- and middle-income countries, that is. Um, and how big are these costs? And this is a very simplified summary of the finding that uh, about, on average, so the, a patient with TB loses about half an annual income. That's the total cost, if you include everything. And what are the elements? Well, first of all, half of the cost is, is uh, incurred before the diagnosis is made, and the second half of the cost is on treatment. So if you want to reduce the cost, you need to look at both things to before people get diagnosed and while they're on treatment. Then we found that about 25% are medical costs. This is paying for uh, drugs and tests and, and the like. Um, so it's important, but it's not the biggest part of the pie. And then we have about 18% other expenditures, that's transport costs, food costs, etc. But the biggest part of the pie is lost income. Now this, are, this is in countries where you don't have a good social security system. You don't have uh, a sickness insurance for most people. There is no Försäkringskassa, to put it in Swedish terms. Things that we in this country take for granted is not available. That is why people often face this kind of cost. Um, now, why is it important to, to look at the cost uh, for patients? We have termed this con concept catastrophic cost due to TB. Why is it important? Well, it's important to break the poverty disease circle. So that's an, uh, an outcome in itself to make sure that people don't get more poor from the disease. But it also has an epidemiological impact Namely, if you, if you uh, mitigate poverty, you will also prevent TB indirectly, but you can also improve access to services by breaking down some of the financial barriers to get in. So improving access uh, and thereby case detection to close that 4 million people gap, it can help, and to improve TB treatment outcomes. All of this together is likely to provide an epidemiological impact in terms of incidence and death of, of the disease. So, what do you then need to do to reduce those costs? Well, we can look at it as two different packages of things that, that uh, are required. One is for the health sector, and that is often called the, the universal health coverage, that everybody should have access to the health services they need, when they need it, and they should not be forced to pay a lot of money for it. That's the concept. So within this, have the right interventions, um, free of charge or very subsidized, 
um, the appropriate technology and patient-friendly delivery means you should do it in a way that doesn't cost and doesn't require a lot of effort for the patient. So decentralizing, doing the diagnosis in one day with a rapid uh, uh, diagnostic test, etc. That is one important part. But then the other part is beyond the health sector. And that is social protection uh, or social insurance. It includes a lot of things that if you had uh, done social studies or, or, or uh, political science, you would have learned much more about this. But I guess most of you are in the health sector and health students. So you don't touch about on, on this too much, except sickness insurance. This again, for Chekhov's cousin, if you're a medical doctor, if you're a health professional, you know what that is, and you know what your role is as a health professional. But then there are all these other potential things like uh, different types of social grants, but also uh, provision in kind of food, of transport vouchers, uh, uh, housing support, and there are also legal frameworks such as uh, protecting people from losing their job if they get sick with TB, for example. So all the point here is to ma make this happen, to reduce the cost, you need interventions by the health sector and by the social sector, and you need to have collaboration between the two of them. Right, social protection. Just to drive home the point that it is important, we did one study to look at um, social protection spending in countries. So all countries of the world correlated it with TB incidents, control for GDP per capita, control for uh, uh, in unequal income distribution, controlled for investments in the healthcare sector. And still, it, we found that there's a correlation so that if you increase the spending on social protection per se, you will have a reduction in the TB, TB incidence. And the marginal effect was biggest for the poorest country. So it makes a bigger difference to invest a little bit more in social protection if you're a poor country compared to if you're a rich one. Now, all of this work um, on patient costs and the importance of social protection has fed into a new WHO um, strategy on tuberculosis, which for the first time has a specific target, which is that no TB-affected person or household should um, uh, experience catastrophic costs with a target of 0% already by 2020. And I'll show you that this seems to be very, very overambitious and not achievable, but it's an aspirational target that should hopefully push countries to really start doing a lot of work in this, in this area. Um, so what this has spurred is that countries are doing quite a lot of surveys to find out the cost, and, and we are involved in some of, of these surveys. So these are, here are all the 30 high-burden TB countries in the world, showing where countries are uh, in the face of planning and implementing such surveys. Uh, just a little taster of what, what we're finding from the survey so far. And this is why the goal doesn't seem achievable, because we found that um, in all three countries that have now uh, official figures, it's more than two-thirds of the TB-affected households that experience this catastrophic cost. And it's worse always for the poorer household, and it's specifically bad for people with multidrug-resistant disease, because it's more complicated, takes more time, and it's more expensive. Um, okay, so social interventions are important, and this WHO strategy mentions some of the things that, that are required, which are partly for the health sector, but largely outside. So the first one is social and economic support to people who are sick or disabled. So this is, again, for Shekhar's Kassan, uh, sickness insurance, health sector with the social sector. The second one is to reduce those risk factors, the direct ones, which are socially determined, many of them. So you can have public health strategies targeting the risk factors per se, or the determinants or the causes in the social situation that is leading to the exposure of those risk factors. And then we have, so this is, again, sort of public health standard work. And then we have the big one, which is poverty reduction, better housing, equity, human rights, which is, again, the SDG agenda, well beyond the health sector. So here are the partners. Health sector, yes, central, but needs to work with the social sector, uh, public health uh, stakeholders, all of government, but beyond governments, so also civil society and patients and patient organizations to make this happen. Right, that takes me back to the SDG agenda. So uh, I hope I try to, I've managed to make the point that we need to look at the interrelation between the health goal and all the health interventions and all the other development goals and all the, health, the things that need to happen within those goals. Because health is a beneficiary and it is a contributor to, uh, to development. And I've used TBS as an example, but there, this is just a case study. And you can do exactly the same analysis for any other health condition, especially those that are so clearly poverty linked. 
Let me end with just one slide where I'll show you a little bit of the type of research we're doing right now to try to, in more detail, answer the question of how to break the poverty disease trap for, for TB specifically. And I circled the two entry points here. One is about improving access, and, and the two areas where we are looking specifically is screening in risk groups, in vulnerable groups. And we're looking at the cost effectiveness, the feasibility, the affordability, and various risks involved in doing screening campaigns. And we're also looking specifically at how to break down the cost barriers to get into care. And then we have one a big research stream, which is about the social protection interventions themselves that we're doing in an interdisciplinary way with others. And here the main questions are, well, first of all, how to effectively get it done? How to, get, how to make patients get access to social protection schemes if they're available? And if they're not available, how to work with other sectors of society to create Försäkringskassan or similar structures to, to allow for that kind of support? And then also to evaluate the effect of social protection, social interventions for patients. Not only the poverty effects, but also the effects in terms of, of access to care, treatment outcomes, impact on transmission, incidence, and death. Because if we make the argument that this intervention will reduce poverty effect, then if you want investment from the health sector, you need to show also that it has an effect on the disease epidemiology. So both types of outcomes are of relevance. All right, um, come to the end, and I'll leave you just with one more quote from, from my favorite guy, uh, Rudolf Virchow. Uh, he expanded on the thought that I shared with you in the first slide, and said at one point that medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. Some people find it a little bit provocative statement, but I think it's something that it's very good for all of you to ponder upon. Thank you. <laughs>